I would uh, like to call the 18th, 2021 Longmont Sustainability Advisory Board meeting to order. Can we please start with a roll call? Yes, uh, Kate Collardson. Here. Mary Lynn. Here. Adam Reed. Here. Uh, Jim Metcalf. Charles Musgrave. Here. Uh, Kay Volmeyer is not able to join us today. Uh, Robert Davidson. Present. Council member um, Christensen is here and staff member Lisa Knobloch. Here. Uh, Annie Noble. Here. Francie Jaffe. Here. Berenice Garcia Teles. Here. Um, Tim Ellis is with us, but he's in another meeting, so he's going to be joining in a little bit. And Heather McIntyre is here. Chair, you have a quorum. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, before we get too far into the agenda, I just want to say congratulations to Bernice for uh, being, are you nominated or awarded as one of the women who light the community? Um, well, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Kate. Um, yeah, I was awarded by that, and I will receive that award in September 30. Um, so if you guys, guys can join me, I will be glad to see you there. I will put the invite on the chat. Whoever. I will send it to Heather for whoever is inter interested. Thank you. Fantastic. Well done. Well deserved. Um, okay, so plowing into the agenda, let's... Um, uh, the, the first thing is the uh, approval of minutes from the last meeting. Yes, Adam. Yeah, I believe I found a small typo in item 9A. I think it should read carbon fee and dividend, not carbon free and dividend. So I think it was just a typo with the R. I just need to drop that. That's all. You are correct. Sorry for that typo. Thanks for bringing it up. Good eyes. So um, given that amendment, could, would somebody like to make a motion to approve with that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm, I move that we approve the minutes from last meeting with that uh, change. Awesome. One second. I can second that, I suppose. All right. All in favor? Aye. All Aye. right. The minutes are approved. Thank you. Okay, so now it is time for uh, the public invited to be heard. Um, we have one person who uh, has uh, a statement to make, and uh, you, you will be unmuted to when it is uh, your turn to speak, please speak, uh, state your name and address for the record. You'll have three minutes to comment and I will time you and please um, do stop speaking when I call time. All right, first up we have um, Bill Althouse with us. Hi, thank you very much. My name is Bill Althouse. I live in Fort Collins. I'm a retired energy engineer in another field now, but I have a long history of dealing with utilities and alternative energy, starting with UL 1741 back in the 80s and 90s to connect small solar systems to the grid. And uh, a number of other committees, IEEE 1547 at 2000, the year 2000, which is how power plants connect to the grid. I'm on a new committee now. Uh, just convened IEEE P 2988, which is interruptibility of virtual power plants to the grid. Now I saw PRPA's responses to questions and I would love the opportunity to get into the weeds on the engineering and economic impact arguments on every one of their answers. I do not have time, but I would like to say in a global response, they deferred to EPRI for our future and what we're gonna do at BRPA. And I can tell you this from 40 years of fighting utilities, they are insincere uh, in every aspect. If EPRI or their consultant SEPA 
likes it. It's a flat disqualifier. If the goal is lower rates and allowing locally owned resources to participate, utilities are monopolists. They will not allow non-utility owned resources to participate and their entire revenue model is cost plus. So any engineer at EPRI or SIPA, whoever made a recommendation to consider the value of a non-utility owned resource or a recommendation that would cost their, cause their cost of operation to go down, I guarantee you they'd be fired on the spot. So I'm highly concerned that every response to every logical question you guys asked of PRPA ends up with deferral to the people who have demonstrated a 40 year track record of not operating in our interest. And that's, and now virtual power plants have dominated other markets. The not number one largest power plant in the world and the number two largest power plant in the world are now virtual power plants that aggregate thousands and thousands of resources into a single operating unit, 100% renewable, totally dispatchable and can be built with no investment because it harnesses privately owned resources and they aren't even looking at what is dominating global markets and instead listening to the entrenched monopolist engineers who want to prevent that transition. So I thank you for your time and uh, I hope we can get PRPA to look at the future and not the past. Great, thank you so much for your comments, Bill. I uh, really appreciate that. And we'll uh, definitely take those into advisement when we get there on the, um, in the agenda, uh, which is coming up. Uh, Mary, I see your hand. Is it possible for me to ask that Bill hangs out because I have some questions for him when we get to that part of the agenda? Is that, is that appropriate? Um, um, yeah, Bill is ahead. still on the meeting um, and will be part of the meeting, but it's up to you guys as a board if you want to allow him uh, to be able to speak later on in the meeting. <clears throat> Well, just to, um, just to do a formal proposal that we ask Bill to hang out in case we have questions for him. I mean, he's on the IEEE committee that's going to make VPTs possible. I feel like that Bill is a valuable resource at this point. Okay. I propose that we invite Bill to stay. Does anyone want to second that? <laughs> I'll second that. Thank just you. For, just for clarification, the um, public members are allowed to stay on the meeting for as long as they want to. Um, so I won't be kicking them off of the meeting or whatever, but when we get to that part of the discussion, uh, we can definitely let him speak since you guys are open to that. So just that yeah. point of clarification. Thank you so much, Heather. So we don't need a vote. He, we have a first and a second, and it seems like more than one. So yeah, no, we don't need a vote for that. Okay. Thanks, Heather. I appreciate it. Um. So next item, agenda rev uh, revisions and submission of documents. I think, Francie, you have something. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to make uh, add some additions for items from staff. I also don't think I've met all board members, so I'll just introduce myself. I'm the Water Conservation and Sustainability Specialist for the City of Longmont. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I would like to give an update to the board um, on the St. Vrain and Left Hand Water Conservancy District funding that I provided a little bit information earlier this year. And then also we have in-person volunteer opportunities coming up for tabling. So I am also going to ask if there's any interest for that and would like to add those two items to the agenda. Okay, um, so we'll add those uh, in items from staff. Does that yes. work? Okay, yes. perfect. Thank you. Um, Okay, moving on to general business. Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I have to run a baby upstairs really quick. I am sorry, I will be back in five Ooh. seconds. Um, this is Bernice. I wonder if we can uh, speak about um, the tabling opportunities in the meantime, while Lisa is back. 
Yes. Uh, Francie, you want to speak about it? Yes. Um, if, if that's okay, Heather, could you? Oh, already on it. So, um, yeah, Bernice, do you want to start with talking about that first one and I'll talk about the second two? Yeah, sure. Um, I would like to invite the Sustainability Advisory Board members to a uh, table in opportunity at the uh, Latino Chamber Fiesta and Food Trucks at the Roosevelt Park on September 18. The city is sponsoring zero waste efforts. So we're going to have a table with all our sustainability flyers and programming and also promote the sustainable business program. So it's a great opportunity for you guys to get to know Latino businesses and, and to have a nice time promoting our sustainability efforts in Long Island. If you, if you want to join us, just let Heather know and we can coordinate together. Thank you. Thanks, Bernice. Um, yeah, and you can see we have two shifts, time shifts available for both are either set up and tabling and then tabling and take down with the focus, uh, we'd probably fo we always focus on general sustainability as well as the Longmont Sustainable Business Program. Um, and then if you've never tabled with us before, we usually provide you with information that's a high level overview and there will be staff presence. So um, we're not just kind of be like, please speak about our program with no context. So uh, we definitely try to um, prep board members and support them. Um, the other two events are back uh, back to back weekends. So it's there's October 3rd is the Longmont Electrical Electric Vehicle Fair that's run by the Sustainable Resilient Longmont. Um, that's, I believe, a Sunday. Again, we'll have two shifts. We'll probably have a big focus um, on electric vehicles, electrification energy, as that's the theme of the fair. But again, just talking about we always try to talk about general sustainability, as we've learned, is that that's sometimes the most important thing because not everyone knows what sustainability is. And then we have an event on October 9th. Um, downtown, there's a Dia de los Muertos celebration. Um, so again, I think we have that split up into two shifts on a Saturday from one to four and four to seven. Um, so for each of those shifts, we're looking for one to two members. Um, and we can either, if someone knows now that they're like, oh, I'm free on that time, I would love to sign up for a shift, we could do that now or um, we can send this up and you all could sign up over email as well. Yeah, Charles. Uh, I can volunteer for the first two events for the second shifts. Great, thank you. Fantastic. All right. Yeah, Adam. I don't know my schedule yet. So would you mind sending that document out? And is there a deadline when you want the responses by? Uh, probably by end of the month okay, would be great. fine. Thank you. All right, perfect. Now we'll look for that and, and reach out to Heather uh, as others want to volunteer. Thank you. Um, Okay, Lisa, baby free Lisa. <laughs> Thank you, sorry about that. The timing did not quite line up today. Um, thanks for jumping in with something else. I am gonna apologize about my weird, not very pleasant basement setup, but I am sick and trying to keep the rest of my house all right. So it's been one of those weeks, I suppose, but I am going to uh, run through a discussion about the sustainability tax um, updates from 2021 and priorities for 2022. And I don't think that'll take a super long time, uh, but definitely wanted to have a conversation with you all so you know what our thinking is and uh, you all have an opportunity to give us any feedback. So Heather, you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, you can go to the next slide, thanks. Excellent, so just a quick project update. I know that we've talked about these things with you all at different points in the year, but just as a reminder. So, um, and for those of you that are, I, it probably just Robert, I believe, um, the Boulder County uh, sustainability tax was approved by voters in, I believe it's 2017 or 2018. It took effect in 2020. Um, part of that, 
uh, tax revenue is set aside as grant funding through the Boulder County Environmental Sustainability Matching Grant, which is a mouthful, but it had been in place for several years and this just increased uh, the amount that's available to municipalities. Um, it had previously been a cap of $15,000 and now um, currently 6% of the tax revenue is split amongst the communities based on population. Uh, and that can go up to 10%, but that's up to the discretion of the county commissioners. Uh, the remainder, 94% of that tax funding is um, split amongst Boulder County um, projects and programs that are determined by the county commissioners. But in 2021, we received $110,000 in change. It also requires a 25% cash match from the city. So our contribution was about 27,500. We put about 40,000 of that to the sustainability grant and program coordinator position, which is a two year um, fixed term benefited position, which is Atra who normally attends our meetings, um, but she's out this week. We also put about $40,000 to the climate risk and vulnerability mapping project, which we've talked about with you all that kicked off in July, and we'll be coming to this group probably in the October timeframe to give you all more of an update on where that project is at. We've just uh, been working with our consultants to finalize the indicators that are going to be mapped with that within that project, and they are going to start on data collection, or they're starting on data collection now and should have that finalized in about a month or so. And then we have $30,000 toward the equity and engagement specialist. Uh, which was also a two-year fixed-term position similar to Atra's position. Um, that person was hired in June, um, Alberto de los Rios. Uh, sadly for us, but exciting for Erie, he actually has been hired as their diversity, equity, and inclusion manager. Um, so he had an opportunity presented to him that you know made sense for for his life and career to move on, it's a, it's a full-time permanent position. Um, so sadly he will be leaving us, Friday is his last day. So we are in conversations both internally and with the county in terms of what, what our next steps are for that position. Um, because we are committed to the county to extend the remainder of those uh, grant funds by the end of the year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so with the Sustainability Grant and Program Coordinator, just an update where we're at. So part of ATRA's position is managing the SOL program in partnership uh, with community and neighborhood resources in our community services department. It's a program that does in-home uh, upgrades through things like uh, lighting and water efficient fixtures and do general sustainability education and connecting folks with resources. Uh, we've trained seven volunteers, which we call technicians that uh, go into folks' homes and do all of that work and connect folks with resources. And so far in 2021, we've done 17 home visits. Obviously, being an in-person, in-home situation, uh, we've been hit pretty hard by COVID on that. Uh, however, oh, can you please go back to the last slide? Thank you. Um, however, we've gotten really good feedback from the community and we're definitely excited to continue growing that program uh, once we are uh, able to, to do a little bit more work out in the community. And we are working on bilingual outreach right now. And then as you can see, we have um, secured quite a bit of funding through grants, the grant coordinator side of ATRA's position. Um, she didn't include, I think, a, a pretty sizable DOLA grant in that. And then as you all know, we applied for that $11.6 million through the DOE. We haven't received that or have been, um, but we should hear word of that sometime this fall. Uh, so next slide, please. There we go. So as I mentioned, the Climate Risk and Vulnerability Mapping Project, uh, we received seven applications from consultants. Uh, we interviewed three different folks and went with uh, RTI International, which is a consulting firm out of uh, North Carolina, but they have uh, folks um, that are housed in the Fort Collins area. So they have local folks as well. Uh, this is a project that is mapping 
both risk and vulnerability within our community to the impacts of climate change. As, as I mentioned, uh, we kicked that off, it says June, but really um, July is when the, the work really got started and we're in the process of finalizing and mapping our indicators. Um, currently, one of the reasons that we really went with RTI was because they had really the, the best grasp of all of the, the consultants that um, submitted pr proposals really around the equity component. And that's a, that's a really key component of this project. So we think they're a really strong partner and we're excited about this project. And we have folks working from um, planning, from community services and from public works and natural resources um, together on this project. Next slide, please. And then as I mentioned, the equity engagement specialist, we hired Alberto in June. Uh, the main focus of his work is coordinating the Equitable Climate Action Team, or the ECAT. Um, so we've talked to you all a lot about that group before. Um, Francie has been leading a lot of that work, and so she'll be, um, she's been working, um, tag teaming that with Alberto, and she'll be stepping back into coordinating that role until we can figure out kind of what our next steps are for this position. Uh, he really led the, the development of the DEI plan for the um, DOE, so a lot of acronyms there, Department of Energy EV grant that we've talked to you all about, and has been working with our community neighborhood resources folks on citywide um, equity and integrating equity into our community engagement process. So a lot of really important work that's happening with this position. Um, and like I said, trying to figure out kind of what our next steps are um, in terms of whether or not we want to chunk some of this apart and figure out if we can contract some pieces out or if we're going to try to rehire right away. I'm waiting for some information on the from the county on what our options are given our grant commitments there. Uh, next slide, please. So looking forward to 2022, uh, our anticipated grant allocation is about 130. So um, a little bit of a bump from this year. Obviously, this year did take a little bit of a hit because of COVID, but um, they were anticipating potentially as much as 20, 25% tax reduction, and they didn't see nearly as much of a drop um, this year. So that was nice. And they are looking at uh, an increase for next year. Uh, obviously, we still have several months left in the year, and hopefully things um, don't take a dive again, fingers crossed. But this is what we're looking at for 2022. Again, that 25% cash, cash match from the city is about $32,000. And these are the areas that we are looking at focusing on. So the first three focus areas are really more um, project or program based. So following up to the climate risk and vulnerability mapping project. So there's, we won't really know quite what the needs are yet till we get a little bit further along, but there could be some additional needs in terms of uh, data collection on more granularity. So one of the things that the consultants are working on is really to make this tool as useful as possible. We need it on the smallest scale as possible. We've been trying to look at the neighborhood level scale so we can really inform um, our decision making around where to target resources and community engagement. And we're not sure yet if we're going to be able to get all of the indicators that we're looking at at that scale. So there might be a phase two to this project that's additional data collection that we may need to um, procure additional data on a smaller scale. And if we don't have to do that, I think that there is uh, an opportunity to then take the information that we have been able to gather through this project and start looking at some potential demonstration projects or programs, depending on the data that comes, um, the findings that come out of that project. Uh, the commercial waste diversion, so that's been, we've talked to you all about the zero waste efforts and the focus from city council. Uh, we have a lot going on on the residential side, but there's still not very much happening on the commercial side. Uh, obviously, a lot of the work that um, Bernice does through the sustainable business program helps to support businesses in waste diversion through recycling and composting efforts. Uh, but there's a lot more that we could really do there. So we've had some conversations with our sanitation manager, Charlie and Bernice to talk about ways that we might do further outreach and engagement uh, with the commercial sector around waste diversion. Uh, there's some potential also to put some additional money toward the PACE business equity program. And I might hand it off to Bernice for a minute to talk to folks about what that program is, if you could Bernice. 
Hello, Lisa. Um, this is Berenice Garcia Tejas. I am the Economic Sustainability Specialist for the City of Longmont, and I'm going to talk to you briefly about this um, program. So, the Partners um, in a Clean Environment uh, PACE, uh, it's, a, it's a department at the county, and they have a, a small business equity program where uh, businesses in the community can replace their old and inefficient equipment and then remove all the barriers. They are applying equity lenses to make it easy for the customer to, to process a rebate and get the equipment they need to run their business. So in few words, uh, the business owner only needs to pay 30% uh, of the cost in a project in, a, in eligible units and the county pays the 70 per, the, the, the rest, the 70%. So this has really, really been very successful, especially with minority owned businesses. And so far, I think 10, 10 Latino businesses have been uh, gone through this program. And we wanted to see if we can allocate more funding and include zero waste efforts to this program since, you know, it's been very successful and attractive to businesses. And especially now that many legisla legislation uh, bills are coming up to, to ban a study of harm or, you know, to start charging plastic bags. So we're seeing that maybe there is an opportunity for us to invest um, in this program uh, by adding zero waste efforts. Great, and we would love to get your feedback. <laughs> Great. And then the, the two potential staffing positions that we would also be looking potentially to support through this grant funding is, again, the equity engagement specialist, as I mentioned, that really depends on what, uh, what we decide to do in terms of next steps with that position, given that Alberto is leaving. Uh, it also somewhat depends, and this is with regards to the program coordinator as well, we have requested in the 2022 budget for um, the program coordinator position, the sustainability program coordinator position to be a full-time permanent position. And we don't know yet whether or not that's been or going to be approved. Um, so those two are a little bit in question, but if, if we do decide to move forward with the equity and engagement specialist position as we had initially envisioned, um, there's, uh, oh, sorry, I neglected to say this, but meant to mention this as well. The community and neighborhood resources um, folks have also requested some additional staffing in 2022 focused on equity. Uh, so if that's approved, then we may not need to continue this position and we, as we had initially envisioned, and we could put more funding towards one of these other um, opportunities. And then similarly with the program coordinator position, if that doesn't get approved um, as a full-time position in 2022, that position will end as of the end of 2021. Um, and we may need to look to put some grant funding towards continuing to support um, like the SOUL program and other things that ATRA has been working on with that position. So I wish I had a little bit more information to bring to you all, but the timing you know, isn't quite working out because we will need to come back to you. And I'll talk about this in a minute in September for a letter of support for the grant application itself. Um, so I wanted to at least bring to you the information that we have today. So I know that things are a little bit in flux, but I did also want to open it up to see if you all have any feedback or questions for us on where do you think that we should prioritize the funding that we have available, given that we probably can't do, you know, everything that we have on our list here, or is there something glaring that we're missing, um, bearing in mind that we're really trying to build on the foundations that we already have, um, not necessarily looking at, at new projects unless there's um, something that's really a key opportunity that we want to make sure that we take advantage of. Um, so I want to open it up for folks if you have questions, um, comments. Yeah, Adam. Great. Thanks, Lisa. I had a quick clarification question regarding the climate mapping. Yep. Did it also include vulnerabilities like ecological vulnerabilities, such as in riparian areas, wetlands, and like open spaces? 
No, we're looking at that mostly. So, and just to give a little bit of more context, which I know I've mentioned in the past, but I didn't say this today. So really in large part, we had been talking about this somewhat before the climate action recommendations report, but one of the recommendations that, that came out of that specifically was a public health plan around impacts of climate change. And this is really the precursor to that of really understanding from a like more of a public health and a social impact standpoint, what are we looking at in terms of impacts of climate change and who in our community is gonna be most vulnerable to that? So that didn't necessarily include what the impacts are to the ecosystem standpoint. I think that that's a really valuable thing that we might wanna look at from a follow-up standpoint for sure. But the focus of this is really from the social and the public health um, component to really understand those pieces in particular, first and foremost. So what we're looking at from the indicator standpoint are, um, and these haven't been fully finalized yet, but I think our, our list is really looking at heat exposure to extreme heat, um, exposure to extreme cold uh, and air quality issues um, and things like that that are, that are more kind of exposure from a public health or safety standpoint. Thanks. Questions or comments? I can't see everybody here. Uh, Jim, I think, was next, and then Mary. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Awesome, thanks, and thanks, Lisa. Um, I was just curious on all those different categories. Are they are they similar costs? Like, is it is it a matter of just things that are all roughly going to cost about the same, or will there be are some of them some of them uh, more expensive than others and might preclude preclude uh, others. Yeah, so <laughs> excuse me. From the staffing st <laughs> standpoint, I mean, um, we would probably want to look at somewhere between forty and fifty thousand dollars from those staffing from that staffing standpoint to make sure that we could at least fund some fund somebody from a part time position. Um, so if we had to fund both of those staffing positions out of this, that would eat up a good, a good chunk of our money. From the program standpoint, I would say um, the PACE equity program and the commercial waste diversion program, um, we could make do with whatever amount we could put toward that and we would just scale to whatever funding we have available. The climate risk and vulnerability mapping project, I would say I would venture to guess we would want again between 30 and 40,000 to do a phase two of that um, with the caveat that I haven't, because I don't have all the information on what we'd be looking at for a phase two, I haven't necessarily scoped that out, but that would be my guess around what we would want to put toward that. Yeah. Yeah, Mary, you're up. Um, hey, sorry, my internet is unstable, so I have to turn my video off to so you guys don't all freeze. So I'll turn it off after this question. My question is, um, has there been any consideration of doing um, DER mapping in the community? Uh, that question I would put to Tim if he is on yet. I'm not sure. I haven't seen his name pop up or we could follow up with him. He's here. I know. Okay. Tim, can you hop on and answer that by chance? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, by DER mapping, you're just uh, talking about figuring out where they're already existing in the community and, and where they're going to be and trying to figure out how it best works in with our grid. Yeah, that's, of course, that's a huge part of our DER plan um, to do exactly that. We need to know there are already distributed energy resources on our grid, um, active, right? And we can, and there Excuse is probably... Me. Been, Tim, yeah. I mean, um, doing DER mapping since Lisa's talking about the social aspect of the programs um, of, uh, of the um, citizens and businesses. Citizens, like, um, like in underserved communities? Uh, or? What I'm thinking is uh, moving in the direction where um, all DERs are connected to the grid, um, getting a sense of what already exists in our community. Right, yeah, we're, that's, I, I, I was, I thought I was going down that path, but yeah, there are existing uh, DERs out there and, and to know where they are. I mean, we don't know right now because they're behind the meter and they're doing it for various reasons, 
Uh, we know where a lot of solar is that have permits. Um, solar and batteries are starting to come on the system. So yeah, we're keeping track of that. Um, we, but that's kind of a lot of newer information. We don't have older information for especially home uh, DER. Um, but we're, you know, we're, we're in the development of projects for thermostats, water heaters, EVs, you know, solar, all those are going to be really important parts of our DER strategy. So, so we'll, we'll have dresses, we'll have GIS mapping uh, to, to, to know where those things are in a community. Because, you know, it's really important for our grid, the way to have our grid op, optima, optimally operate. We're going to have to know where to best use DERs and how to use them, depending right down to the feeders, right? Some feeders are older, some feeders are have issues, some don't, some are new, some have a lot of capacity, some have zero capacity. So lining up the DERs with our grid is going to be a real important effort as we move forward. So can I ask how that information is being generated? And I'm wondering if it could be coordinated with some of this other outreach that's happening through the programs that we're discussing right now. Yeah, you know, the, I, I haven't, we haven't coordinated with, um, with Lisa's group on, on things, but I, we will be talking as our efforts are colliding all over the place uh, these days. So we're work, working together on a lot of programs and, and certainly all the programs that I'm going to be, we're going to be developing, uh, we're coordinating with, with uh, sustainability. So it will be a coordin coordinated effort as we move forward. I don't know about the funding and all these different things. You know, at LPC, we have our own, our plan and our understanding, and we're trying to, um, you know, follow or achieve the goals, but we haven't really figured out us any kind of coordinated funding for tax money or sustainability tax. So that hasn't been figured out yet, if that's what you're getting at. No, I'm just simply asking um, if there's some way to coordinate with the social programs to find out who has DERs and who's planning to bring them in, especially on the larger scale in the businesses. Yeah, yeah, um, that's, we are. I mean, we don't even, we don't really, we don't have any demand response programs even right now. Uh, and we're just starting our DER planning process, but but knowing where they are is one of the first steps and, and figuring out where to put them is a, a next and follow-up step. So certainly we're gonna have, we're gonna be undergoing that effort for sure. And businesses are going to be a big part of it. And I'm hoping small businesses, because they're really the most underserved community as far as, you know, commercial community. So, and they operate a lot like residential communities. So they have similar types of equipment. So I'm hoping to tap in and, and understand how we can help those communities and also use that type of equipment to help our, our future, you know, renewable goals. Well, having a two-way connections to the grid would go a long ways. Yeah. Yep, and, and they have to have the equipment to support that and we have to have the platform to support that and all that's in the works. And I'll be happy, I can touch base with Tim after this meeting too to discuss what the potential funding needs, if, if any would be in terms of a mapping standpoint or if that's something that we can do internally, I'm, I'm not sure. And we, Tim and I can have that discussion offline, but um, to know that that's, at least on the radar of this group, we can follow up with and discuss that more. That would be great, Lisa. I would love to hear about that in the in the future, what the plans are and how much has been completed and so forth. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. So I had a question about um, the the position. You said that that um, the. Please correct me if I'm misremembering, but. Uh, the, there was a, an equity person who was in the sustainability department who mm -hmm. was departing yeah. and there is a potential position in another department that could make up for that person, right? Is it that I? Uh, uh, sort of. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, so the equity and engagement specialist position when we had first um, decided to seek sustainability tax money for that uh, last year, it was just a climate equity position that was just gonna be a part-time position focused on helping to coordinate the equitable climate action team and supporting the sustainability team and the, the, the rest of the city staff in incorporating equity into climate action. Cause that's uh, you know a big focus of ours and was a big focus of the climate action recommendations report. 
um, through the Just Transition Plan Committee recommendations, now the Equitable Climate Action Team, just to keep everything as clear as possible for folks. Um, I know it's a lot to track, but when we, when we had brought that idea um, forward, because there's also a citywide focus on equity right now, our city manager um, wanted to see if there was an opportunity to expand that position to also look at and support citywide equity work that's largely housed in our community and neighborhood resources um, division, which is in our community services department. And Carmen Ramirez, who really leads all of the equity work, who sustainability, we work really closely with her and her team. So we came together and crafted a job description that was equity and engagement specialists that would be um, partly focused specifically on sustainability and equity and climate action, and then also would support the citywide equity work, but they would be housed in sustainability because we were funding that position. Um, so it's been really a collaborative position between the sustainability program and the community and neighborhood resources division. And that's how we envisioned it for, um, for we got it to be approved for a two year part time or two year fixed term position. Um, in the meantime, uh, because there is more and more of a focus on equity, we are in the, the process of establishing an equity office that's housed within Carmen's group. And so to support that office, she has also requested additional staffing capacity in 2022 as well. So if that's approved, there could be less of a need um, for this position to continue to support citywide equity work, if that makes sense. So it's more of a collaborative position, but there's additional staffing being requested on that side as well for 2022. And we just don't know yet whether or not that's going to be approved. And when when do you, do you have a timeline for that approval? Or yeah, you? it's actually on our last slide, but um, oh, yeah, so I that, that, sorry. Oh, no, no, it's, a, it's on the last slide where I'll talk to you all about um, next steps, but I'll, um, the, the budget conversation has been waking it its way through our leadership currently. Uh, our city manager is going to city council on August 31st to talk about the city's budget proposal for 2022. And then we have conversations with city council all throughout September, and then city council finalizes the 2022 budget in October. So we still have probably about two months of conversations with leadership and city council before that budget is finalized. And in the absence of the person who is leaving to, on Friday is like, it seems like in that timeline, it would take about a, a, that amount of time to hire somebody at least to yep. fill that position, right? Yes. Um, and well, maybe we should let you get to your, the rest of your slides. <laughs> no problem. Um, you can before I, I keep I asking have, questions, I'm just curious. I just about. have one more slide that's just the next steps um, kind of timeline. So if you want, I can pull that up real quick and talk you through that, and then you can ask your additional questions, or you can go ahead and ask them now, and I'll give you the information. I, I have not, I have a good, like, I, that I'm able to formulate my question. I'm just trying to figure out our... It, is it going to work to wait until the you find out about funding before you replace that position? Is there a, a tremendous amount of work that's being lot, not done um, in that time frame? And yeah, what kind of commitment? Um, yeah, it's definitely a challenge from a timing standpoint, um, and also, like I said, we have um, we have a an obligation to the county to expend the county grant dollars by the end of the year. Um, so that's in part why we're in conversation with them now of kind of what are our options in terms of making sure that we expend that money and we still fulfill what the work that we committed to the county um, to. And at the same time, as I mentioned, having Francie step kind of back in more of the coordination role of the equitable climate action team and we are looking at potential opportunities to con contract out some pieces of that so that we can get all of that work done in a manageable way in the interim till we figure out kind of what our next steps are. So 
yeah, there's a lot of moving pieces that we're trying to, to figure out right now with that. Okay, thank you. Yep, sorry, not a lot of information right now, but <laughs> trying to figure it out. Yeah, understood. <laughs> All right, uh, any other questions or comments and, uh, before I just pull up our last slide that just talks about next steps? Okay, great. Heather, if you'll do that real quick, great. Okay, so um, the next step for us is to really go to council to give them an update on where we, we are in terms of all of our sustainability and climate action progress as we talked about with you all at our progress update last month. Um, so that'll be happening in the um, probably September time frame. I'm supposed to go next week, but since I got sick this week, that's kind of gotten pushed out, unfortunately, but that's our next step is to also keep council abreast of the priorities that we're discussing for the sustainability tax. Um, as I mentioned, the 2022 budget conversations and are happening now and will be happening with council in September um, as well and finalized in October. Uh, we'll be coming back to this group for a letter of support for our September meeting because our application is due in October. Um, although the date hasn't been set yet. They, the county doesn't have their entire timeline other than the application will be released sometime in September and due usually about six weeks later. So if I have a little bit more time, I may bring the letter of support to you in October. So we'll have more time to really get into all of these different components that we're trying to figure out right now. Um, but in the past, it hasn't lined up time-wise, so it, we may be coming in September for a letter of support with this group. Um, so hopefully I'll have that information pretty soon uh, from the county. But And then our application will be due, and then the uh, awards are made in the first of the year. So the nice thing about this grant is that it's the application process is um, more of a formality than anything, as long as we're you know, doing our due diligence, do our doing our due diligence with the county, then these grants are already this grant funding is already allocated for the city of Longmont. So it's not a competitive grant process. It's more of a form um, a formal process to just make sure that we're using the money that the way that we've spent and there's accountability to uh, the county commissioners and the residents of the county that this money is being spent in the way that um, was determined through the tax. So um, that's that. Is there any final questions or comments before I pass it off to the next item on our agenda? Holly. Thanks. Um, so Lisa. You are going to do a presentation to council at the end of August? I was planning to come on the 24th, but I got okay. sick this week and that's been, so now that's gotten pushed out probably to sometime in September. We haven't rescheduled that date yet. Oh, okay. So yes. be sure to remind council that they need to give a matching grant. So that's in the budget. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Yeah. And that's already in my 2022 budget request because I know that this happens oh, okay. every year. So I build that into my yeah. operating budget. Yep. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. But I'll remind folks that they know that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to pass it off to the next item on the agenda. Fantastic. That is uh, PRPA response follow-up. Tim. Yes. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I don't have a presentation on this. I just wanted to supply the responses that we you know, we got from Platte River, and, and a lot of those questions were you know, it's pretty specific to LPC and Longmont, the city of Longmont, um, you know, when, when it's regarding the distribution grid and customers, you know, that's more pertaining to us, while the, the bulk renewable or bulk energy transmission system um, and uh, our electric, our bulk electric needs are kind of geared more towards Platte River. So uh, I just wanted, we put this on the agenda, I think, to have discussion amongst you guys to see you know, what your thoughts were on the responses and, um, you know, have an internal discussion and I can answer any questions, some questions that I can answer. I can also take some notes to 
follow up with um, Platte River as necessary and, um, you know, keep moving forward. Thanks, Tim. Um, before we get into the discussion, I just, I, I'm going to put a time limit on this um, so because we do have a few other items on the agenda and we as a board tend to really get a discussion. So I, I'm going to try to cap us at about half an hour um, for this topic agenda. And I just want everyone to know that. So that said, Mary, I see you had your hand up. This is where I, um, uh, I would like to um, uh, um, ask Bill Althouse to um, also respond to some of the the, the questions, um, I sent them to Heather. She said she's going to send them out after the meeting. Should I read the um, the questions and then have him respond? Or can Bill just do that since there's three particular questions that have to do with the involvement of advisory bodies that I think that he could speak to? How should we do this? I, yeah, I think Heather, that is... Um, Kate, I think you guys can do it however you want, but my suggestion would be to hear from the board members first and then open it up to um, Bill's okay. responses. Okay, so okay, I, I, um, I had closed my proton mail because my, I'm, my um, connection is unstable, but let me just open it up and so I can read those questions. So it's going to just take me a second. I apologize. Um, okay. Um, sorry. Could you, could you tell us which questions are like, they're, are they not, they're numbered or page that you're referencing? Um, might be easy just for me to, so I could see the responses and, and all that when you find them. Okay. So um, I don't have the number. It's um, should Platte River invest in more energy storage instead of rice units since capital cost for battery capacity is lower than gas. The second question is what, what is Platte River's R&D budget? And um, then regarding all questions on EVs and the grid, um, vehicle to grid. Um, so anyway, it's... So I, I apologize. Don't I? I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I um I I think that um, Bill Althouse's comments on these three things are are worth hearing. Okay. Um. Thanks for that. Do board members have any uh, questions, uh, comments for Tim before we? Uh, yes, Polly. Um, I was rather disheartened to learn that Platte River Power Authority will be receiving its last uh, coal shipment in 2030. They're supposed to be done with coal before then. So if they're getting their last shipment of coal on December 31st, they're still going to be using coal into 2031. And I, I understand we have to transition, but if we're actually, if they're serious about transitioning, surely they should be getting, you know, transitioning out of it seriously before 2030 because they're supposed to be done by 2030. Anyway, so I would like to hear what Tim has to say about that. And also I, I would like to remind people that the only person, the only two people who can vote um, on this are our representative uh, from the utility and the mayor. So think carefully when you vote for mayor this time. Um, should I respond? I, I mean, I don't, I'm not gonna respond on behalf of Platte River, but what I can say is, you know, they're I think they're closing that last coal plant um, uh, and in 2029, right? So I think they have to guarantee a coal supply until that time. I'm not sure if they were how specific they were and what actual date. Maybe they miswrote the date because obviously they have to line up their coal shipment with the shuttering of a plant. So I think that was their intention is we need to work.
Uh, Tim, you're frozen. We lost Tim. Yeah. yeah, we might have lost Tim. That's... Yep, it looks like he froze. Okay. Either froze um, or he's really good at this. That's a really good frozen face. Um, if he's acting. Um, <laughs> But I have an unstable connection as well. So maybe I'm frozen too. Uh, you are not. Yet. I did, I did oh, send him a Teams message to let him know that he's frozen. I'm not sure if he can do anything about that, but at least hopefully he's aware. Yeah, he just left the okay. meeting. So I'll let him come back in when he gets back, when he gets it. Okay. Um, well, I'm getting to hear that has questions for uh it looks like charles and robert uh, adam lots of people okay so um yeah go ahead so, so just a couple of comments i mean with the limited amount of time we can't really get into the weeds or details but generally i was you know relatively disappointed with the responses i think i mean in some ways they're logical but they're logical within kind of the overall um seems like the feel, um, overall lack of a firm commitment to accelerate this as fast as possible. It seems that um, you know, they have this 2030 timeline and if circumstance, you know, they, it's, um, they're basically going to, um, they have no commitment or don't express any commitment to really pushing any harder than they have to. So that's just kind of the, the impression that I got. Um, there were a few things that I thought were kind of um, not quite either correct or, um, you know, I, the, the first question that Mary referenced about the, um, you know, their commitment to going with, uh, rice, um, for, uh, peaker gener uh, power generation, um, and then stating about, you know, the thing about battery replacement and things like that, there's, uh, that's probably currently not exactly true. The battery costs are, are coming down. There's other uh, stationary energy storage besides lithium-ion batteries, and um, some of them have very long uh, cycle lives, and the, the price and the price is coming down. So, um, I think it, it just seems like they're not very committed, or in some ways, not anticipating that there's going to be uh, dramatic technology innovations on the renewable side, where the um, fossil fuel side is the, the pace of innovation is very low and the costs are not going down. They're on the renewable side, pace of innovation is incredible and the price continued to drop. And so I just was, it just seemed that they weren't particularly committed <laughs> to taking advantage of those trends. Thanks for that, Charles. Tim, you're back. Yes, sorry about that. Right as I started talking, internet like cut me off. It's just the way it goes. Yeah. <laughs> um, sorry. If, did I? Did you get any of my response, or was it just right at the beginning? We didn't get any. Oh, I'm sorry. So what I what, what I basically responded is that um, the the rawhide plant, the coal plant, is they anticipated closing it in 2029 sometime. So they have to have a, a coal supply until that time. I think they they need to match up what their you know energy resource is going to be with you know the fuel the fossil fuel to to run it so so I, i'm not sure if they answered maybe incorrectly or were too general but i believe what they're trying to do is line up their their coal purchases with the closure of that last coal plant okay thank you um uh, yeah robert and then adam yeah, so I guess my question is, is more around uh, harmony between the different communities that PRPA supports in their sustainability vision. So Loveland and Estes Park and Fort Collins, are they similarly positioned with Longmont or is that a gap that PRPA is struggling to, to work through? No, that's a great question. There are different focuses for each different community. Uh, some are more progressive than others, even amongst our four, even though there are only four, but, but we're really all on the same page as far as pushing that renewable energy goal. 
and uh, in, in having Platte River fulfill that um, on their part for us. So there is alignment on that in that regard, but, but we all do stuff a little differently, you know, as any, any few cities will do a uh, slightly different uh, tone and, 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 you know, progressive attitude, as I said before, but, but yeah, we're, we're all aligned on the goal, but we're probably going to reach it in, in several different ways specific to our cities. And, and as far as programs and incentives or, or whatever else, you know, we're going to need in our toolbox, um, but we are all focused on that goal, and Platte River certainly has it in their, um, in their, in their contract or in their mission statement now to to achieve that that goal, and I think they are working on it. Is that specific enough? I, I mean, I, there are probably other resources we can point to as far as. Uh, you know, Fort Collins' sustainability plan. We, of course, have a really great sustainability plan and, and our own efforts, but it's very specific to each city. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, Adam and then Mary, I see your hand. Yeah, thanks, Tim, for answering Councilmember Christensen's question about the coal plant. I also had a follow-up regarding the ride plant. I'm wondering how long will it take to phase out its uses? Like, is it really a step function where it goes from burning coal until 2030 and immediately stops? Or is there some phase out process that'll take a few years and it'll still burn some small amount of coal uh, during that time? In my understanding it with the IRP, and that's all really I have to go with as well, is that they are going to phase it out by the end of 2029 20, so that they can meet that objective. And that's why they're talking about how to fill the gap, you know, with renewables, DERs, you know, potentially that rice plant, but that's still a kind of an idea on how to actually achieve shutting down the coal um, and not the end, the end, that's it. That's what we're gonna do statement, you know, but I believe they're gonna stop burning coal at 2029. That's my understanding of, of what they're saying in the IRP. Um, Mary. Sorry, I want to return to this question. What is Platte River's R&D budget? I am very concerned that um, they're pushing off their R&D and essentially um, uh, deferring any more sophisticated way of thinking about energy resources in the community to EPRI, um, which is an industry um, organization. And um, I think that we are overdue to create a citizen um, sort of task force involving the four cities and the expertise that is here to recommend a restructuring of the way that we look at uh, local energy. Um, this is uh, something that I um, would actually like um, to uh, to ask um, um, Bill uh, Althaus to respond to since he's working on a, a, a committee that will is building standards that will help to bring um, community resources, you know, to the fore, um, if that's possible at this time. Are you there, you Bill? Want, oh, you want Bill to respond? I'd like to also respond to okay. um, the, the, the email and, and uh, your question as well, Mary Lee, as soon as Bill's done, I guess. Uh, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to, to chat a bit again. You know, EPRI's position is pay no attention to the consumer-owned VPP behind the curtain. You know, these are already the biggest, most profitable power plants in the world, all based on consumer-owned resources. So not only are the biggest power plants in the world, they were built at no capital cost to the utility. It's just a piece of software. And I think to get to the future here in the short term, we need to really look at economic impact of localization of these resources, the economic multiplier it generates. Uh, Platte River's IRP, they're not gonna do anything until 2029, and then they're all gonna be purchase power agreements with corporations. And so all the benefits of ownership, the tax credits, the RECs, depreciation, all of those economic benefits are gonna leave the community to outside Wall Street type investors. Goldman Sachs, oldest partners, 
just threw in a billion bucks a piece, $10 billion, to launch the 100% renewable virtual power plant in the UK markets. These guys are not environmentalists. I think we've got to bring the business community, if we want to see change, we've got to turn it into a profit center. Right now, based on Platte River's projections of cost, rates are going to go up and up and up with a massive expensive expense in 2029. The business community needs to understand this can either be a, a really heavy expense or it can be a profit center. Limitations like you can only install 120% of your use prevents like big commercial entities from doing community solar over parking lots and getting subscribers and the electric vehicle thing, their response there shows no awareness. Volkswagen has already announced they're going all electric vehicle and in 2022, all their vehicles will have vehicle to grid on board, allowing them to be a utility storage resource. Uh, Ford F-150 onboard inverter. I'm also on the SAE J3072 committee writing the technical standards for onboard inverters with electric vehicles with BTG capability. This is not theoretical. They'd like to tell you that this is all in the future. Two biggest automakers, Volkswagen and Ford, already have products coming at us right now with V2G capability. You know, plot the, the curves of storage we need. Turn off a coal plant, we're going to need 500 megawatts of storage to go with 500 megawatts of renewable to cover us. Well, if you look at the adoption curve, how many F 150 Ford trucks were sold in the four service territories? If this goes electric, just conventional vehicle sales will provide us the storage capacity we need to go 100% renewable at no cost to Platte River. A small incentive to the vehicle owner, boom, you have your storage. There's so many options. And I, I like what Mary Lynn said about putting together a group and talk to, instead of the EPRI people, who any one of those people would be fired, same thing at SEPA, they would all be fired if they recognized the value of a customer-owned resource or they made a recommendation that would cause the cost of operation to go down, they would be fired. That's the reality. So how about the people building these massive power plants? I'm in communication. I have a really nice uh, webinar by the head of engineering of a company called Kraftwerke. And that is a commercially available software platform right now to run a VPP. It's running the second largest power plant in the world at 9.6 gigawatts composed of entirely consumer-owned resources. So to say you can't replace central power with 100% DER is crazy when it's the most dominant successful technology in the world at this moment. So uh, if anybody would like to see that webinar that gets deep into the weeds of how virtual power plants work, um, I would be delighted to share that, but it's, we really need to make sure they're looking at what's doable. I feel with the EPRI, it's the equivalent of asking a fourth generation cattle farmer to design your veggie burger business. It's just crazy to even ask those people what they think about the technology that's going to make them obsolete. Can you send that link to Heather and she can send it to us? Absolutely. Thank you, Phil. Um, Tim, I, I assume you want to respond, but I want to acknowledge that uh, Jim has his hand up. That's fine, so Jim. If you'd like to go ahead, I can respond afterwards. Uh, that'd be great. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. Um, I mean, I, I, I certainly think that we need to have all options on the table, but one of the things that I think concerns me a lot about the idea of, um, of about, about everything Whenever I see pictures of the the people that can generate their power and uh, on their own, it often feels that it is um, that it goes against many of the necessary changes that Longmont as a community is going to have to make. The primary one being we're going to have to become a much more dense city, so we're not going to have the same amount of roof space per citizen for solar panels. Uh, or yard space, and and I I certainly don't want, and I know that this isn't what he was, what Bill was implying, but I don't want to encourage more people to buy Ford F-150s, whether they're electric or not, because roads and parking lots are never sustainable. 
there, there is no sustainability plan that ever begins with, we're gonna build more parking lots. Um, and so as much as I uh, am very much a proponent of, of decentralizing as much as we can, I also think that we have to keep in mind how important the, the, primary, the primary drivers of Longmont becoming a sustainable community are that we're gonna be a more dense place to live with more public transportation. And that's going to that those are necessary requirements that um, that are going to preclude some of the things that that uh, many of us might like to have. But um, but I think that in terms of in terms of prioritizing how we're going to get to sustainability, we really do need to keep the kind of the, the big driver uh, in 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 our mind right now. And with the city expecting another 30,000 residents in the next decade or whatever that is, um, uh, whatever that's gonna be, um, and envisioning the type of communities where people are gonna be living that are gonna, that are gonna allow that, um, I, I think that we have to keep that in mind uh, when we think about how we're gonna actually a, a accomplish these things. Okay, um, so there's a lot of things that were said there. I'm going to address, I think, the research and development item, and then maybe talk a little bit about the vehicle to grid issue. Um, and I'm not going to, for the response from Platte River on r and I'm not going to respond for Platte River, but what I can respond is with my own personal experience of my career. I have over... 20 years of working with large IOUs, investor-owned community uh, utilities, which Longmont is not, and Platte River is not. Um, I worked for Con Ed New York. I worked for Hawaiian Electric. I also worked with Department of Energy for a few years, and I worked for a, a really large renewable energy developer, and all the while being a dedicated utility customer. So I've been on all, all sides of the issue and, and looked at it in many different ways. Um, and I can tell you this, on the utility side, back in this, you know, in the heyday of the utilities in the 50s and 60s, 70s, 80s, they've had a really significant R&D budget. And they spent a lot of money doing a lot of great research, but it was very expensive. And what the public utility commissions ultimately did in the 90s was to remove those budgets from the ability of the utility to collect those funds from customers. You know, they took it out of the rate base. So there really wasn't the ability for utilities to do their own R&D on a, on a uh, on a, a large scale. Um, plus, there are so many utilities with so many similar and shared issues, concerns, needs, that organizations like EPRI were formed to kind of get the utilities, get funding together to do um, R&D that everybody wants to look at. And I can tell you from personal experience uh, with EPRI, when I worked with Hawaiian Electric back uh, nine years ago now, we did a, a pilot with them to look at hot water, grid interactive hot water heaters. And we actually did a pilot with them and we ended up installing a bunch of them. And now it's it's getting to be a full scale program there. So to say that they're outdated and, and they don't do anything, I think is, is not really fair. Uh, they are a very hardworking and intelligent organization that does a lot of important R&D that frankly utilities don't have the funding to do. Um, that's just speaking on my own behalf as far as R&D and utilities and and the things that EPRI can do and things that the utility can do. And now on, on our side, what we're trying to do is take a look at technologies that are getting to be out there, like well, thermostats have been forever and water heaters, but there's new ways to act with smart thermostats and you know, sm smarter ways to, uh, to act with solar. And then EVs are coming into play now and then batteries. And um, so there's, there's technologies changing and it's becoming smarter and easier to work with. We're looking at programs to do demonstration projects to really work with all those um, residential items. And, and we're also gonna be de developing things on the commercial side as well. So I can say, as far as our own R&D, we are doing demonstration projects. We're developing them now. We, you know, a year ago, we didn't have anything in the pipeline, but now we have two or three or four things we're actively working on to, to try to get out there and test and make sure we know how to properly scale those programs up for our community and for, you know, on behalf of our community and all the, um, Platte River communities. So we are, I think we are doing a lot and we're starting, we're starting off, but there's a lot of great opportunities. And I think we're in a pretty good position to get those up and running in, in a few years, uh, at least on a residential side. Um, so I'll answer any questions on that, but I wanted to also address the EV side, the vehicle to grid, I'll address really quickly. 
Um, that is, I mean, you say it's right now, but it's not right now, right? The Volkswagen said they're going to have all of their batteries two-way. Nissan is the only, uh, custom, only car manufacturer that actually has two-way capability now and doesn't void the manufacturing, battery manufacturing um, warranty by using it in that fashion. So there's a lot on the car manufacturer side that needs to be done. There's a lot of stuff that needs to be put in place just on the car manufacturing side, not a, and, and not the least of which is the Ford F-150 electrics haven't come out yet, right? They're going to come out with, where when they come out, we're going to look at them. We're going to see if there's that, cap that capability to um, enable them as a DER. And it sounds like it, it will be, but it's not yet. It's, we're still, the industry is really new on that and we're all figuring it out right now. Um, the ability to do that. How, how do you do that? And as far as a small incentive to customers, I'm not sure that's really true. If I spend all that money on a Ford F-150, you think I'm going to get to let the utility play around with my battery for some small fee? I don't know. I don't know how a lot of those customers are going to feel. That has to be figured out. The market it ha isn't even developed yet. The only one locally that I know about is I know Boulder is the city of Boulder is running a pilot on, on a V to G right now, which is great. And we're, I'm talking with them you know, regularly to see how that's going. And there's a lot of uh, ways to build that out and understand it better. So on the V to G side, it, it will be there and we'll definitely be playing a part in it, but it's a, a super brand new um, industry really. And it's just being developed and, and we're going to tag along and, and be part of it. Go ahead, Adam. Thanks, Tim, for that. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Just a quick question. Will the DOE grant have any pilot programs to study that? Yes, that's the great thing about that grant. And we will be finding out in late September, late October, we have, uh, we're going to be working with NREL to study the school bus fleet V to G. And we also, as part of that grant, will be able to purchase a few of those uh, uh, Ford F-150s because we need them as a utility, you know, for, to do uh, the work we need to do in the field. We already use those vehicles. But we're going to be purchased, we're going to be swapping them out with the new electric vehicles, and we'll be able to study how we can use those V2G when we get them, and that will be in the next few years. So that's that's definitely opportunity uh, that we're looking at now, and it's already in the plans if we get that grant. And, um, and even if we don't, we're moving ahead with um, a fleet plan now to electrify our fleet, and we're going to look at the opportunities to start there. Because we, since we own the vehicle, we can test it out for V2G capabilities because it's ours and you know that's one way to move forward without depending on a customer and a lot of legal and other contractual arrangements with using their battery uh, to power the grid and whatnot. So as a starter, we're really looking at that grant and, and any purchases we make in the next few years to start looking at that vehicle to grid because it's certainly an interesting opportunity. That was a great question, Adam, thanks. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question that is, I don't think it was addressed at all in, in the list of questions that, because it's a question for LPC, um, about solar homeowners and um, paying a monthly fee to be a sol solar homeowner. Is that, is, is there something in the works to maybe make that go away? <laughs> um. You know, I don't know about go away, but change maybe, you know, the, the whole net metering, you know, net metering was put into place originally and originally in order to promote the industry, you know, get people to install um, solar on their roofs. Because if you have to install solar and battery, then that cost is huge, especially 10, 20 years ago. So to bring that um, and and also so the utilities know what's going on on the grid, right? If we know which coming, what's coming on, what's going off, it helps us better manage the grid and make sure we have the um, equipment out there to, to have grid work in a safe manner, right? If you're putting, always putting juice back onto the grid on a transformer that can't handle it, that's going to be a problem. So I think the net metering was in place for a long time to support the industry and for us all to understand how solar is going to work on it. Um, I think what we need to figure out is what role solar plays on the grid. There's a lot of benefits, but there's also wear and tear on the grid from two-way, you know, distribution, which was never the case before you know, a decade or so ago. It was only one way from the generator all the way to the home and that's it. And now we're talking about two way, not only with solar, but battery, you know, EVs. So there's a lot of this two way communication, two way electric flow 
that we're going to have to understand in order to appropriately monetize the benefits and costs of that. Because there is a cost to having the utility, the grid operate as a battery. That's essentially what it's doing with net metering. We'll take your extra you know, electricity, we'll hold it for you until you need it. And if you don't use it all at the end of the year, we'll credit you back for it. That's the way the net metering works. But there's a cost to that. you know. And uh, we have to figure that out. Um, the, our rate uh, analysts try to put a number on that. Um, the, the dynamics between us and our customers are, are changing rapidly. Um, so we're going to have to continue to analyze that and, and figure out, out the fair compensation or a fair rate because we also don't want to um, subsidize solar customers with our other customers that can't afford solar or don't or can't put it on for one reason or another, um, can't put it on the roof. So there's a lot of reasons on both sides to have it and not have it and you know, figuring out what the value is to the system, but also what are the costs of the system so that everybody is treated fairly. Uh, with their utility bill is something we're continually working on. Thanks Did I answer that. your question at all or completely dodged the question? <laughs> ben, <laughs> I, I appreciate <laughs> what you're saying. Okay. Um, and yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a calculation. From our, from. Yeah, it's a calculation from our rate folks to, feel, to try to monetize the impact that or the use of, of the grid as a, as a battery and, and you know, it's going to change going forward, I'm sure, um, as more DERs get up and running and more of these programs come out and more of this equipment develops the technology to put energy back on the grid, there's, there's going to be a lot of change and we got to have to uh, figure it out as, we, as we're moving through it. Thanks. Uh, Mary. Tim, it's always really interesting um, and educational to hear your perspective on all of this because you've been involved in this for so long and it's it's great to be getting a real picture of what sort of the Muni point of view is. Um, I do have a question for you though about reinventing the wheel. All of the concerns that you've brought up have been solved by other cities around the world. And there are cities in the US now who are working on bringing in VPPs. Um, isn't there some benefit to reaching out to people like Stadtkraft or Kraftwerke to see who their consultants are who can come in and maybe they can say, oh, well, in our virtualization software, here's how we address with this. Here's the, how we put together the community committees that answered these questions. I mean, it seems like, and you're certainly not getting any of that stuff from the industry related research um, entities because they're, um, you know, obviously to some degree, they're going to be protecting the interests of industry in being a centralized energy creator, in, in my opinion. I think, you know, different utilities have different interests, Mary Lynn, you know, that you're certainly right. There are utilities that want to keep that, that um, well, one way, you know, old fashioned utility style and hold on to that, 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 um, that amount of all their assets and keep them running and make as much money as possible. There's a lot of utilities that are complete opposite that want to do what's best for their customers and, and, you know, have renewable energy and sustainability goals. So I think it's all over the map. Um, we do talk all the time. We're always in conferences. We talk with the, the, our member communities. We talk with communities throughout Colorado. We talk with the Department of Energy and NREL and, all, and, and a lot of local consultants on what it, this whole future is going to mean. And the virtual power plants is, you know, we're working on um, if, we, if we come forward with a, a um, like bring your own thermostat program, that is really attaches itself to a, a DERMS platform, a distributed energy resource management platform, which is a virtual power plant, right? I mean, that's that's really what you're talking about. And that's those are the things we're lining up, but we wanna do it right. We wanna do it so it, it, we have a good long-term plan and don't piecemeal it. There's a lot of cities, like you say, that are already there, but they have um, a thermostat program. They have a contract with Honeywell and they have a contract with the Ecobee and they have a contract and then their contract with Google fell through. And then they, they got to set up this system and they're constantly patching and adding on. And it's like this Frankenstein of a derms, right? That they're trying to create. We're in a really good position actually, because derm, the, 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 that management system is really developing now and it's, it's dependable and it's, it's getting to um, be able to accommodate all those different devices and, 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 and manage them really well. So we're actually on right on that edge of saying we're going to step into that derms market, but we want to make sure that we have a product that can accommodate the future too. So and the future is still developing with the V to Gs and all that right. stuff. So so it's a big effort. We want to set it up correctly, but we are moving forward on doing some smaller demonstration projects in order to understand 
how that's all going to come and, and, and work up to a, a really nice, sophisticated DERMS platform that we're going to be using for the future. Okay, so I know that Jim has his hand up and other people. I just want to, because you mentioned NREL, can you speak about what's happening with Modern West and how oh, yeah. that's part of We're talking, I mean, they're, they are working on their own with NREL before we even got involved, but we're, we're in active talks to see what, what, um, what, what uh, opportunities we have. And we'll, we'll be coming back to you guys, I'm sure, later in the fall or early next year with ways to work with, with that development. They, you know, they're just getting started. They have a really a mixed use um, development that's super interesting. They wanna do a lot of new things. We are in, in talks right now with what opportunities we can we create together. So for sure, we're working with them. Okay, uh, thanks. We, we've, the amount of time that I was, I, I allotted, are there folks like Jim, Charles, do you, you, do you is, do you squeeze in your question? I'm willing to <laughs> give you the floor for a sec. I, I want to say something just real quick. Although I'm, you know, disappointed with you know some of the language that is used in the responses. At the same time, um, you know, I, I want to acknowledge you know the the power you know the utility industry has actually made a faster transformation towards renewable energy than any other industry. And you know they've done a lot in in, in the U.S. Um, and other countries, especially places like the, the U.K. So um, they have tens of trillions of dollars of installed um, infrastructure that you know needs to be converted. So in some ways, I think we need to acknowledge that there's a lot that's already that they need to do and that they've actually already done. And if you look at things like you know, sorry, the general public hasn't done as much as they should. How many people take public transportation? I ride my bike to work every day here in, in Boulder. How many people are driving their cars past me? How many people have installed ground source heat pumps in their homes, et cetera, et cetera. So in, in some ways, I think we should be progressive. We should work hard on these things and we should push um, Pat River. Um, but I think we also need to work with them and be partners with them and not antagonize or I'm not sure what's the right word, but I think we need to appreciate much of the good work that they've already done, but push them to do even more. Thanks for that reminder, Charles. Nobody um, hears it. Well said. Sure. <laughs> um, Tim, thank you for your thoughtful answers. We appreciate your expertise um, and yeah, and your time to walk through all this with us. Thanks, anytime. Okay, um, so the next item on the agenda, Annie, there you are. Yeah, um, we're gonna change subjects right now. Um, so I wanted to invite you all to a joint board meeting um, on September 20th at 5 p.m. It's um, a meeting that's been scheduled after the water board meeting. I think the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board is also invited. It's a Zoom meeting. And um, it's a meeting where the left-hand watershed center is gonna be presenting their annual report. And I'm not sure if you all are familiar with the left-hand watershed center, but um, they're a nonprofit organization whose mission is to um, do restoration and um, restoration projects along the left-hand watershed. And so they've done, um, the city has funded some of their work. They've done um, like, uh, forest restoration, river restoration projects, uh, forest fire restoration projects. They are working on adaptive management studies. They're really, um, their focus is on watershed health and maintaining and restoring watershed health. Um, and they, they do a lot of work um, with the city of Longmont. And um, we thought you would be interested in learning more about the work that they did last year and the work that they're looking to do in the upcoming year. Um, so I just want to encourage you all to come. It's a Zoom meeting, so you don't have to go anywhere. It's at five o'clock, September 20th. Um, and it's right after the water board meeting and you might get to meet some of the water board members. And I think maybe the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board um, is also invited, so Adam. Thanks, Annie. Will we get emailed a link to the Zoom meeting? Yes, cool. you'll get e emailed a link the day of the event. Um, and so if you could put it on your calendar, September 20th, 5 p.m. That would be great. And it's a two-hour meeting? 
I don't know the time frame. I don't think it'll take that long. Um, they presented their annual update to our leadership team. Um, and I think that was only scheduled maybe for an hour. Um, I'm sure you could stay on as long as you want to. It's, it, their presentation wasn't very long. I think it was a lot of questions and answers, so. Okay, fantastic. So we'll, right. we should, we, we will all automatically receive that link. We so, it's just book yes. it now. Yeah, I would just, yeah, if you're interested. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Francie. Thank you. So when I was um, presented to the board in May on the water conservation update, I mentioned that the St. Vrain left hand and left hand water conservancy district mill levy funding that became available um, this year, the city was looking into applying to that funding, but in the end decided not to apply this year. We'll continue to look into that in future years. Uh, we decided not to apply for a couple of reasons. Um, one, we are planning to do a pretty extensive update to the water efficiency master plan. Um, if you all recall, or board members who were present last year when we reviewed the Climate Action Task Force recommendations, there was one around water conservation, and we decided to not pursue that recommendation, but did propose, based on feedback from the Sustainability Advisory Board, the Water Board, um, to instead reevaluate our current water conservation goal for the city based on climate, more extensively on climate impacts. So instead of doing just maybe a, a year process to update this, we're taking two years. So we realize that process will start earlier uh, than expected. I think we're going to kick that off pretty early next year. So I think we just want to make sure we have plenty of time to focus on that. And even though the mill levy funding is an exciting opportunity, it does take time to give updates on grant opportunities and do that work. So we think it'd be a better funding to pursue once, um, once we have a better kind of farther in the water efficiency master plan process. Um, we are also in rec uh, requesting an additional um, half um, FTE water conservation position. Uh, so that also, since we still, we're still don't know the status of that. So that will also impact uh, to staff time and ability to apply for a funding opportunity like that. this. So with kind of the staffing up in the air and then also this extensive master plan update, uh, we decided to make more sense to wait on this funding opportunity. Please let me know if you have any questions. That makes sense, thank you. Any questions from the board? All right. Thanks, Francie. Okay. Um, I, the next item on the agenda is the land management discussion. Lisa, um, you are leading that discussion, it looks like. I'm, I'm actually going to punt it back to you, Kate. So we <laughs> had put it on the agenda because you had brought it up. It was the very, very end of the meeting last last meeting and I it, hopefully I understood it right that you wanted to have a conversation with the board about whether or not you all want to utilize the land acknowledgement statement that council approved um, at your meetings. Is that correct in my understanding that, of that comment? That works. Okay. That so perfectly. I will... <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Um, so uh, in your board packet on page 15 um, is the land acknowledgement state um, that uh, I think we supported uh, sending to the, 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 the board, uh, the, sorry, the city council and in a prior board meeting. Um, so the statement is we acknowledge that Longmont sits on the traditional territory of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute and other indigenous peoples. We honor the history and the living and spiritual connection that first peoples have have with this land. It is our commitment to face the injustices that 
happened when the land was taken and educate our communities, ourselves and our children to ensure that these injustices do not happen again. Um, and this was adopted um, in July. So uh, my thought was to start our, our sustainability advisory board meetings with this statement. Um, I, for me, it's, uh, I think it's a nice reminder, something that I um, am not, I, I don't acknowledge regularly. <laughs> um, and I think is, is good for us to keep in mind. Are there objections to, uh, to having this as like the first item in the going forward? There was last time we talked about it, somebody, somebody mentioned that perhaps it might feel a little bit rote after, you know, just to, to just say this and, and not necessarily, um, that, that it could lose its meaning. Um, I, I'd like, to, I, I would counter that, like, um, it hasn't lost its meaning yet. <laughs> And perhaps we give it a chance to lose its meaning by um, Polly. Yeah, I think that was me. Uh, you know, we only meet once a month and um, we are the sustainability board. And, you know, I, I do, I was the one who made that comment, but I, I think that it would be a very good idea for us to, for this board in particular to open our meetings with this. Yeah, Adam. I'm wondering what the thoughts are of some indigenous people now. Like, do they have any suggestions or advice? For these types of statements? Yeah, I asked council member Christensen this question earlier and I was wondering what they, if, what they had to say about it. Repeat that again. <laughs> If the city council had the same added, um, repeat your question, please. Sorry, I was just asking Adam. if, can you hear me? Okay, some of the images are frozen. I was just asking if any uh, indigenous people now have any advice or thoughts on this. I think the concern earlier was raised that it might become rote if it's presented every meeting. And I was wondering if there's any other concerns along those lines that we might be overlooking. Uh, you know, we're going to have um, a, a meeting with the uh, Northern Arapaho in September, um, which is our uh, finally the acknowledgement of our uh, relationship with them. And it would be, if you would like to attend, it would be a good time to ask them. We, you know, we just, nobody asked them. <laughs> So that strikes me as a little odd, but that's typical of what people do. Um, yeah, so, you know, I don't know if uh, the Multiculturals um, Board has discussed this. I think they did. I think this is where it originated with the museum, I think, or the Multicultural Board. So um, it might be interesting to ask them. Nobody else on city council had any other uh, concerns. Thanks. Thanks for that. I I could see a, a concern of this is a very small gesture um, for you know white people to do and and does absolutely nothing for um, to to repair any of the damage that was caused, um, which I think is a, a valid criticism. Um, and uh, I think that to at least acknowledge, um, like to say some of this stuff out loud is, <laughs> is more than I'm doing right now. Um, so please. Um, I just want to jump in really quick. I do, I do want to acknowledge the work that Carmen Ramirez and her team has been doing in particular in relationship with the Northern Arapaho and the sister cities 
um, project. So I, I can't speak necessarily to her involvement with them specifically around the land acknowledgement statement itself. Um, I haven't been directly involved with that to know the level of conversation that has been happening, but I do want to acknowledge that that relationship has been in the works for a very long time. I believe they are signing the official agreement with them, I believe on September 18th. So that's coming up pretty quick. That that relationship, having a sister city relationship um, with a, um, a First Peoples Nation is the first in the country. They've invited Deb Holland to be a part of that process as well. So we, we do have a relationship with the Northern Arapaho that folks in other parts of the city have been working on. So I did also want to make sure that people knew that and that that was acknowledged. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Francie. Thank you. Uh, that actually reminded me that um, uh, we were recently in a meeting with Carmen where staff were also asking, when should we use this? When shouldn't we? And potentially inform that that figuring that process out is still in the works. That's still figuring out uh, when is it appropriate to use it? When does it make the most sense to use it? Uh, and kind of how to connect with board and commission. So that's um, that was also, I um, just want to make you all aware, there was the, the um, I think that was on August 4th, the last I heard that I was still trying to figure out how and when and when it was appropriate to use this. Great. And we can definitely, we're happy to keep you all updated on how that evolves within our organization as well. I definitely think that it's uh, perfectly reasonable and appropriate for you all to decide how you want to use this statement within this group. Um, I, I agree with Kate that I, I don't think it's rote at this point in time. I do think it's important to build into our understanding and our acknowledgement. And I think that it, it does also, though, I think help remind us of the additional work and lots of work that still needs to be done in terms of repairing the harm um, and our relationship uh, with Native communities here as well. So we'll keep you up to date on that conversation as it evolves within the city, but I, I do think it's also appropriate for you all to decide for yourselves how to can, how to use the, the statement itself and what else might be precipitated from that. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Jim and then Polly. Yeah, I mean, I think my perspective is that it becoming rote is um, less of a danger than it becoming non-existent like it might have been two years ago. And with the understanding that we will um, be open to improving our use and application of the statement, it seems like including it would, uh, and making it part of like the, you know, the, the Robert's Rules of Order style ceremonies that we go through, like there's a reason that we do those things. And, and it seems like that uh, the it becoming wrote is, is, is the, the, the danger I care about less. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, Polly. I also suggested that we, um, at a city council meeting, that we make this, that language or that, that specific statement at the bottom of uh, any new signage we use for open space. Because then everybody who uses open space will see this again and again and understand it. And I also would like to see it as a, <clears throat> as a plaque in the city hall where people who come to pay our bills or people who come to look at different things would see it, particularly next to the quilt that the Northern Arapaho made for us and that we finally have gotten around to hanging up. And um, so, if we see, not, don't just hear it, but also see it. And um, I know the museum's done a lot of stuff with this and will continue to do so. So um, I do think that there are ways that we can incorporate it into anything written that the city puts out and uh, any signage and things like that, particularly for open space because, well, obviously. <laughs> All right, thanks for those thoughts. Um, I, so then Heather, will you please add it at, at the beginning of the meeting um, where it is first appropriate? 
I don't know if we wait till after we determine a quorum um, to for for that to be read or or where it makes you know fit fits most appropriately in in Robert's rules of order. But we please do that. Sure. Um, Thank you. I don't know if you want to do it maybe just after, like you said, the determination of the quorum before all of the business stuff starts. I think that makes sense. Okay, I will get it added. Fantastic, thanks so much for doing that. Sure. Okay, um, that's the end of uh, items from the board. The, the next item on the agenda, unless anybody has anything to jump in with, um, is items from council. Uh, <clears throat> well, we didn't meet this week and um, <laughs> last time we met, it was a study session and we met for only half an hour, which was a record. So <laughs> I don't really have anything except that to, to um, remind people that there is an election coming up this November. And also that um, our what we will be discussing from for many months now would be the budget. So. Keep it in mind. <laughs> Thanks. And and our budget is consider. I mean, our uh, we just got some financial um, information from uh, the head of finance, and our the financial outlook for the city looks much much better. Uh, we still are about two percent short of budget, but for most things. Um, but that's much better than being 35% short. So <laughs> we are coming back. Um, we don't know, nobody knows what's going on right now with COVID, the COVID variants, Lambda and Delta. And, uh, but I think we've all come to a point where we're much more flexible and we've learned a lot. And I think we have uh, the facility to mitigate our behavior in a way that's safe. If we can just get the knuckleheads who haven't vaccinated themselves vaccinated, um, we wouldn't have been in this position in the first place, but you know, <clears throat> if you know any people like that, continue to work on them. <laughs> I don't think you'll have much luck, but you can try. Thanks. Thanks, Polly. Yeah, Charles. Yeah, I had a question for, uh, uh, Polly, uh, there's only two uh, voting members from each um, owner community for Platte River, and one of them is the mayor. How does the mayor uh, become informed about um, what the community they represent wants in terms of um, you know, um, what to, you know, how to vote um, for Platte River <clears throat> items on their, on their um, agenda? Well, that's a very good question. Um, it, the mayor, it's the mayor's responsibility to inform himself or herself. And um, we do have a lot of meetings like this. Uh, I, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, you guys bring things forward to, uh, uh, to city council meetings Sustainable Revolution Longmont or Sustainable Resilient Longmont um, brings a lot of things forward. Various people bring things forward. So it is, um, you know, kind of optional. That's why I'm suggesting that you think hard before you elect a new mayor. Um, yeah, it's dependent upon what what people bring forth and our discussions. And we do have, we do have planned discussions both at, in, during council sessions and sometimes study sessions uh, that are supposed to illuminate us about <laughs> sustainability issues. Yeah, so, so um, that's kind of what I suspected. Um, I, I don't know if it's possible, but it'd be interesting um, to, for example, if, if there are um, items where um, <clears throat> board members of Platte River Authority are Power Authority are going to be voting that maybe those questions um, be disseminated, for example, to the member communities. And for example, we could 
we could discuss it and provide a recommendation to the mayor on what, what our recommendation is for how they might vote on those things. I think that's a good suggestion. Um, I also plan to forward uh, Platte River's questions, the things that we got in our packet to the whole council, because I think they're very interesting. Some good questions were asked, and uh, I think it's important for them to understand the, the uh, answers. I also think that this, we had a very good discussion today with uh, Tim Ellis and Bill Althaus and uh, all of you, and I think it would be worth, uh, I'm going to recommend that council members look at this discussion, you know, because that it is unfortunate that we are all supposed to be liaisons, but we never have any time whatsoever to discuss what we learned and what our observations are um, with our fellow council members, whom we can only meet publicly. Um, and so uh, that was tried by council Mem member Peck and I, but um, was rather uh, overwhelmed by other forces. So anyway. Um, <laughs> thank yeah, you, Polly. It's difficult. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Polly. I see Jim and then Mary's hand. Polly, am I right that you're term limited and that you will be leaving us? That's right, I'll be gone in two and a half months. Um, so um, what is the process for the new liaison being picked, assigned, volunteered, stuck with us? Um, and is there any possibility that that there is any process? I mean, I, I have no idea what the process is because you were here when I got here. Um, I, do you, you know, does somebody have to like steal a sword from you and then they get to become the liaison or something like that or? Uh... Well, everybody has different schedules and um, we have something like 30 boards. So each one of us, well, almost each one of us has about eight boards that we go to as, you know, uh, aside from city council work. So we have to be able to manage um, our schedule around and, and several people work. Um, so we have to be able to manage our schedule around when boards meet. So sometimes uh, what we take up is something we're passionate about. I am passionate about this board, but uh, other times it is something that we, nobody really wants to do it and they sign up for it because whatever, you know, they'll take it on. And uh, there are several boards that only meet four times a year. Uh, so, but yeah, it's a voluntary thing and city council members discuss this among themselves and figure it, sort it out because uh, it really depends upon our schedules and when we can actually show up for these things in a reliable way. Mary, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanna mention that I would like to put on um, a further agenda a discussion about formalizing Charles' um, most recent suggestions. Okay, uh, thanks for that, yeah. Uh, can you recap, Heather, will you what, please add that? Can you recap what those suggestions are? Could you do that, Charles, not me? <laughs> or just send them to me, Charles, if you would. Yeah, I, I was afraid you were gonna ask me. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I can do that. I'll send you something, but just to make sure I, <clears throat> um, uh, that Mary and I are uh, talking about the same thing. <laughs> uh, the idea that um, before, you know, for things that are uh, on the agenda for um, Platte River to vote on, that uh, they get forwarded to us beforehand and we can discuss it. And if we desire, uh, send a recommendation to the mayor uh, for um, how we recommend that they vote. Perfect. Is that right? Thanks, Mary. <laughs> awesome. Are you, does that make sense, Heather? Yes, it does. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I just, yes. Annie, go ahead. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I think the next item on the agenda 
is to adjourn. Is that right? Yeah. It, yep. The informational items, but. Oh, I'm sorry. I, but, don't, I just wanted to bring up that last month the board voted to um, have a trial meeting, you know, at the time of the meeting. And I just wanted to remind folks of that. And I know that I think Jim wasn't here. So I just wanted to. That's um, right. Annie, keep us honest. Thank you. Um, so Jim, you were not here for this discussion. Kay was also not here and she is not here again. Uh, but we had talked about uh, moving meetings to five o'clock. Um, no, six o'clock. Six o'clock, sorry. Um, to, to be accommodating to members of the public who might want to be heard but have to work. Um, and I uh, can't necessarily take the time off to come to this meeting at three o'clock. So um, we didn't want to make that decision without everyone having a chance to weigh in. Um, and you were not here. So do you have <laughs> any objections? I, and I don't know what we'll do about K. No, no I, I mean, that, that'd be great. I, I take, I take, paid time off for every meeting. So I would no longer have to do that. <laughs> That'd be wonderful. Yeah. Yes, Heather. Um, I did talk to Kay on Friday when I was talking to all of you about um, moving to a remote meeting. And she said for the fall, it would not be a problem, but in the springtime due to um, extracurricular commitments with her kids that would um, make coming to the meetings a challenge. So just um, FYI for you on that piece. Okay, um, so I, I, I'd like to try it. I do, I, I do like the idea um, and what we're all that we're trying to, to achieve there of, of getting, you know, being more accessible. Um, so can we give it a trial run for next month? And, um, and maybe, maybe a couple of times, maybe, th well, start with one, one week, in our meeting next week, next month. Adam. Yeah, I support that. I can be flexible either way. I think if we try the 6 p.m. time, even if it's a few times, I'd be curious just to see if there's an uptick in the number of folks speaking at the public session. So that could be potentially a metric to look at. Good call. Yeah. I, I thank you, Adam. Uh, yeah. So, um, at least until December, if we don't move, I will have a conflict with all of the meetings. Um, unfortunately, something I can't get out of, I was appointed to, I'm on a committee that reviews all tenure promotion cases for faculty in the College of Engineering. So their careers depend on, on us doing our work. So I would, if we don't move to a later time, starting next month, I won't be able to attend for the rest of the semester. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, definitely value you being here. Yeah, Jim. All right. My only concern actually are for the city staff members who have to be here and who aren't volunteering and to make sure that it actually fits with their, um, it's, it's easy for me to say, but I don't actually, yeah, it's not, not a paycheck that it depends on for me. So I'd want to make sure that it's okay with the city staff members. Thanks for that. Um, um, we did hear from them that they were okay with it, but let's, let's all, <laughs> Register that again, please. Yes, we definitely appreciate the consideration, but we it is it is definitely part of our job and we are happy to accommodate the board in whatever way you all, um, direction you all wanna move. So thank you, I, I definitely appreciate it though, Tim, or Jim, thanks. <laughs> yes, Francie. I am able to attend on all Wednesdays that the ECAT is not meeting. Uh, sometimes they meet on the third Wednesday. So if uh, that, they, there may be a conflict and I would have to attend the ECAP meetings. But that this year, the, for the end of this year, that would just be, well, that'd be um, October and November. And we haven't decided on meeting dates for December. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, yes, Annie. Sorry, I, I keep thinking of um, <laughs> some business uh, things that we might need to have to attend to. Um, and this is a question for Heather. 
I, I think if we continue to meet remotely that we have to do something to the bylaws to address that, is that correct? Yeah, that's, um, it would need to be a bylaw change that we could do. And if you all wanted to do that today, we actually could, um, given the scenario, uh, the way things are playing out. I don't know if it makes sense for us to continue meeting remotely through the end of the year. Um, Sustainability Advisory Board, you all decided at the beginning of the year um, to just have meetings through November and no December meetings. So would it would really just be the next um, three months that we would making, be making that bylaw change for. And then we would revisit it again in January um, for the meeting time and um, anything that is part of the bylaws as well. So it could be changed if you want to do it here in the short term um, as a trial kind of thing or whatever. Um, it is actually a good time to do that. So I'm not, I, I guess I'm not clear on the, we have to change it because we changed it last time to meet in person. No. Or, so when no. city council decided to go to the in-person meetings and actually the emergency um, declaration ended for the pandemic, um, the only reason that we are allowed to meet remotely is because we were under an emergency declaration since that has um, expired. Um, if we want to continue meeting that way, our bylaws have to make that provision for us. Mary. I'm not willing to vote on that until we've heard from at least some members of the public about how they feel about remote meetings. Okay. Uh, how are we going to solicit opinion from the public? Um, meetings? From my experience, I can tell you in the three years that I've been at the city, we've had a lot more participation from people in the community. Um, since we have been remote than when we were in person. I don't know what Lisa's experience is. She's probably the longest one um, on staff in that regard. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. But what is the public saying? Are they saying they prefer? I haven't heard anything that direction. I just know that uh, it seems to have been more accessible to them, but maybe Polly's heard from council meetings. Yeah, Polly. Uh, we've had much, much less uh, public participation since going to remote. But I think that's, you know, it, I think every board is a little different. I, I do think that, um, for instance, I'm on the Boulder County Consortium of Cities and many of those people live, well, they live all over. They live up in Jamestown and Ward and it's certainly, a lot easier for them to uh, deal with things remotely. Um, so I, I just, I think it's up to every board. I would throw in, and, and this is just anecdotal, it's, I, I can't say that I've done any community surveying on this, but I would say that probably the time of the meeting is more of a factor than it being in-person versus remote in terms of people's ability to participate. Thanks, uh, Jim. Yeah, and I, I mean, I also think it's it's difficult because like what baseline do we compare it to? I mean, do we compare it to a pre-pandemic baseline? As I, I don't I don't know what participation would have been, you know, it, it, it's, it's just a different beast. So it's, it's I, I find it difficult to kind of envision what the actual comparison, what the realistic comparison would be. And I know for me, I feel a lot more comfortable doing these things remotely still. Um, especially as things explode, maybe not in Boulder County, but who knows. Yeah, I tend to agree with the, the variance that are, and, you know, just the uncertainty there about what is actually happening with, uh, with COVID and, and it just, remote meetings feel safer <laughs> to us and the members of the public. Um, and so I, I I wonder if um, if we could if you would be comfortable if we plan on a a meeting a remote meeting next time um, for that reason and um, and then we can and put that put it on the agenda to to talk about the next uh, the following two months so September meeting 
third Wednesday, six o'clock remote, and then talk about October and November. And Lisa, I see you're coughing, but I saw your hand briefly. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, I wanted to ask, and I don't know, but this question is for Heather, although I'm not, um, I don't know if you have the answer or not, but I don't know enough about the process to know, can, can we put something in the bylaws that that is, and maybe this is what you're saying, but just that essentially allows for remote meetings as needed, and then the board can determine on whatever basis, what the criteria are, you know, so that it could be in place essentially for as long as we want it to be in place. And then, you know, fingers crossed that this is not something <laughs> that we have to revisit over and over again into the future, but that at least it's there and the board can pretty quickly make a decision. And we have the technological capabilities to, to do that. So we don't have to keep revisiting it. Yes, I think that is what we could do. That's a great suggestion. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so do we need to vote on anything right now or are we gonna do this temporary for next meeting? Yeah, if you wanna just do it temporarily, I think it's okay to um, just say we had general consensus to meet remotely and then uh, reassess and at the September meeting, um, further discussion or whatever for changing the bylaws for allowing those type of meetings. Okay, great. Let's do that. Thank you. And um, and will you please add agenda that we want to discuss this so that Annie doesn't have to <laughs> remind us. Um, we appreciate you, Annie. Thank you. Um, okay, I I just so the last item on the agenda or before we adjourn is uh, that there are informational items in your board packets. Um, they're there for you to read. Um, just calling your attention to them. I also want to quickly um, acknowledge my disappointment that there is not a sword stealing ceremony for the liaison <laughs> from city council. And with that, <laughs> I maybe I'll introduce. Is one. there a motion to At Golden Pond? I think you should. Long dresses. We, if if somebody volunteers for it, we need to all do a surprise recycling inspection of their house to make sure they're up to pass. <laughs> Good idea. I can bring medieval costumes. Yeah. Perfect. All right, we've got this all set up. Uh, so, anybody like to move to adjourn? Yes, Charles. Uh, I'd like to move that we adjourn the August 18, 2021 Longmont Sustainability uh, Advisory Board. I will Thank second you. that. Awesome. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> all right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Take care. Take care. Take care. Bye. Thanks.